Um, hey everyone, it's definitely a pleasure to have been invited to speak at All Things Open yet again. I've, I've definitely, I would definitely have loved to have been there in person in Raleigh, but nonetheless, I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate virtually and want to send a big shout out to Todd, uh, Danny and the whole ATO team for making this happen. My name is Angelo Dronungati. I am the executive director of a nonprofit technology company based in Nairobi, Kenya that builds open source tools that enable communities to respond to critical events and supports them to leverage technology to fight for social justice in their communities. Um, I like to think of myself as a technologist, an open source software advocate, and a community builder who's passionate about building and using appropriate tech uh, to create impact in the lives of marginalized groups. So today I'm going to be drawing on insights from the work that we've, we and along with our community have been doing on COVID-19, just to think about the critical role that open source has played in responding to this pandemic and what it can do to help us prepare for what's to come. The World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic on March 11th, 2020. And by this time, more than 4,000 people were dead and more than 14, 114 countries had confirmed cases of the disease. I remember seeing people wearing masks while traveling at the airport and thinking, okay, it's serious, but it can't be that bad. And then boom, we went from zero to 100. Governments around the world instituted restrictions to curb the spread. Um, Kenya had its first confirmed case on March 13th. And a few days later, we shut down schools, pubs were closed, gyms are closed and a dust to dawn curfew was also imposed um, nationally. I think the story is likely the same in many parts of the world, if not worse. And as time progressed, several problems became apparent. One, there were substantial information gap, informational gaps. Scientists and doctors didn't know enough about the disease and its effects or how to treat it. It was difficult to identify hotspots, not only for governments, but also for citizens. And people didn't know where to access protective, um, you know, personal protective equipment. And of course, in a vacuum of credible information, misinformation thrives, giving rise to the COVID-19 pandemic, such as what you're seeing on your screen uh, right now. Second, while lockdowns may have been effective in slowing down the spread of the disease, they had far-reaching social and economic effects on citizens. People have lost their jobs. Um, vulnerable and high-risk communities have been unable to get access to information and critical resources. And of course, as governments have instituted curfews, police officers have taken that as an opportunity to hammer down on citizens. In my country, Kenya, um, the Kenya, the Independent Policing Oversight Authority, which is the only authority that can hold the police force accountable, has received 87 complaints since the end of March, documenting more than 21 cases where people have been killed. Most of all, Governments around the world have had limited capacity to respond to a crisis at this scale. Healthcare systems were unable to respond to increased demand for testing services, and there were limited resources to handle critical cases, even um, in ICUs. So local communities sprang into action. With Ushahidi, my company, having been used in nearly every global crisis since 2008, we were overwhelmed with requests from support, requests for support from all over the world, all coming in at the same time. Since March 2020, Ushahidi's open source crowdsourcing platform has been deployed more than 1,150 times in 116 countries by grassroots organizations and community actors seeking to understand the pervasive impact of COVID-19 and also creating visibility into where to access critical resources and services, fill informational gaps for uh, official response, and hold governments accountable for any shortcomings in responding to the pandemic. I'd like to dive in into two powerful examples um, shortly. So one of the first ones is um, Frana, Frana La Curva. Um, by the time a national lockdown was, by the time Spanish authorities imposed a lockdown on March 14th, all 50 provinces in Spain had confirmed cases. And on the 25th of March, their death toll surpassed that of mainland, Ch mainland China, coming second to Italy's at over 3,400 people. A group of volunteers, entrepreneurs, activists, social organizations, makers, and the public, as well as open innovation labs, then partnered to provide useful online resources, as well as public services around the citizens using Ushahidi to flatten the curve. 
initially the project started off as a forum where these volunteers could come together and you know collect a repository of where um, critical resources are, curate this information, and you know just brainstorm around ideas of how to provide these services to the general public. But eventually it evolved into a map that connected people who needed help with volunteers. To date, they've collected more than 10,000 reports and have donated over 28,000 masks to Spanish people. All of those dots that you're seeing on the map right now is either you know, someone saying that I, I, I don't have groceries or I need help and you know, being able to get, to get connected. And I think the beautiful thing for me is that they've not only been supporting people in Spain, but now they're also sharing their expertise. They've built a model that they've been able to replicate in 22 other countries around the world. So there's 22 other Frena La Curvas out there in this world. A couple of countries just to name them, Portugal, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Chile, Mexico, Uruguay, Bolivia, Argentina, Colombia, France, Peru, Venezuela, Brazil, Guatemala, Germany, and Poland. And this is all from the work that they started. You know, they, they created training manuals, they've funded activities and media campaigns and all of that and are supporting all of these other different countries to try and do the same thing and support um, their own communities. Now let's move on to the second case study, uh, which is you know documenting COVID-19 testing experiences globally. Um, WHO's Director General has time and time again impressed upon governments to test, 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 noting that this has been the key to saving more lives. And while there's been a marked improvement in testing capacity, many countries are still not conducting enough tests. China has, of course, been leading that pack. I think the reports of them having hit more than uh, four or maybe five million tests in July this year. What you're seeing on the screen right now is a snapshot from our world in data um, that you know, basically picked out um, information from any country that had this information publicly available. And as of March 13th, 2020, according to the publicly available data sets, um, the UAE, United Arab Emirates, was leading in testing capacity, conducting, I think, eight, eight COVID-19 tests per 1,000 people, right? As of October 9th, 2020, I think only five countries, aside from China, have been running more than 500 COVID-19 tests per 1,000 people. That's Luxembourg, which is at a 1,388, the United Arab Emirates, at, that is at 1123, Bahrain is at 915, Denmark is at 751, and Singapore is at 525. In Africa, Morocco, South Africa, and Namibia are leading with 77, 74, and 43 tests per 1,000 people, respectively. My country, Kenya, is still at around 10 tests per 1,000 people. Now, one thing to also remember is that at the onset of the pandemic, there were reports of people being turned away because of limited testing equipment. And in some areas, it was just plain expensive. I think in Kenya, there are reports of you'd spend probably about a hundred bucks per COVID-19 test. There's not that many people who can afford uh, that amount of money. Now, SafeCast is a nonprofit organization that was formed in response to the, devas the devastating Japanese earthquake and the subsequent meltdown of the Fukushima nuclear power plant in 2011. They launched an Ushahidi powered crowdsource map to help people around the world document the COVID-19 testing experiences. Their goal was to provide credible information based on first-hand experiences to help inform government response around the world, as well as hold uh, officials accountable to citizens who required urgent assistance. They've been helping to put faces to the numbers and enabling people around the world to tell their stories, both harrowing and positive. What you're seeing on the screen right now is an actual report that came into the map. This is somebody who sent in a message about them not being able to breathe. They went to the hospital, or rather they, they called in and asked for a, an ambulance and were told to call back when it gets worse, at which point they could have been dead or they could have been unconscious. So it just shows you the extent to which people were suffering uh, while looking for COVID-19 COVID tests. So it was really important just to create um, awareness around that. And I'm sure that there's many more like that if you were to visit, if, if you were to visit their, their deployment. Now, there's so many more examples such as these that demonstrate how open source has played a critical role in responding. I think open source has played a huge role in lowering barriers of access to information and tech. It's encouraged information and knowledge sharing, and it's also enabled wide scale uh, engagement. 
However, while this is commendable, it's, you know, it, it's amazing that, you know, you, we can leverage the power of uh, open source to, you know, figure out ways of responding to problems in our communities. I've also been thinking about how we can start to shift our strategies from being reactionary and responsive to preventative and being, uh, being prepared. There were warnings of pandemics breaking out, uh, you know, published in reports spanning decades, decades. Um, and there's more than 1,400 known human pathogens that are capable of causing disease breakouts. So it wasn't a matter of if, but really when a pandemic would break out. Now, it's not lost on us that many of our behavioral patterns right now in responding to COVID-19 are eerily similar to uh, historical pandemics. For example, the Spanish flu of 1918. Even then, communities imposed quarantines, schools were closed, public gatherings were banned, uh, public gatherings were banned, and citizens were urged to put on masks to curb the spread of the flu. Anything sound familiar? <laughs> However, experts globally are lamenting the fact that it doesn't seem like we're learning from the previous outbreaks, be it the Spanish influenza, be it Ebola, be it AIDS or SARS. The Spanish flu killed 50 million people in two years. AIDS has killed 31 million people since 1981. Ebola's financial impact over two years, I think this, this was uh, by a report by the World Bank in 2014, was estimated at 32.6 billion US dollars. Yet here we are seven months into a global pandemic that has killed more than 1 million people in that it's threatening to have a disastrous impact on the worldwide economy and is unraveling years of progress that has been made, that has been made in trying to bridge the gap you know, right now it's exacerbating inequalities in low uh, and middle income communities. So we have to ask ourselves, where's the gap? Why is it that our, our governments are unprepared to handle disease outbreaks despite years of scientific research, recommendations from previous epidemics? Why is it that our current, you know, our existing social protection programs are inadequate to shield citizens, despite having experienced similar economic impact in years that have passed with, with other outbreaks? Now, this might be a controversial thing to say, but there, there are also several reports that have emerged that have shown that China suppressed information regarding SARS for nearly six months during the outbreak uh, a few years ago, and that the same thing likely happened with the COVID-19 outbreak, that they kept quiet for over a month. I have to ask myself if the world would have found out about this sooner, if internet freedom wasn't an issue for the Chinese population. China's internet censorship is said to be more advanced than in any other country in the world. Does this make a case for fighting for internet freedom around the world or promoting freedom of speech and embracing platforms that empower ordinary citizens to tell their stories? Internet freedom and access are definitely critical in enabling that free flow of information and promoting freedom of expression. And I think that we can use that as a tool for preparedness. However, we Surveillance is not the only blocker to access. We also have to look at the cost. Cost is also a substantial contributing factor. I think in many, probably even in, in my last presentation at All Things Open, I mentioned the fact that there is a pent up demand for the internet, but many people in the global South still can't afford it. And so we have to ask ourselves, what, does, what are some of the things that we can do now, whether it's infrastructural developments or partnerships, or you know, what are some of the things that we can do to try and bridge that gap and make the internet accessible to everyone around the world, regardless of the financial ability or what tools um, that they have access to. Now, platforms like Humanitarian Data Exchange and Our World in Data, which I referenced before, have also been very useful in helping many of us understand the pervasiveness of this pandemic, aggregating and visualizing data sets from countries that have made this information uh, publicly available. But still, COVID-19 has magnified the gaps that exist in enabling efficient sharing of data and specifically around health between global health actors. Um, I think what we're seeing now is that, you know, we have individual healthcare systems, whether it's at local, regional and nat national levels that are all capturing their data in different formats. And it's taking so much time for them to integrate this and extract the learnings that can be shared across other systems. I think one of the things that we need to do is invest in building interoperable data exchange systems, especially in the health sector, not only at local and national levels, but also at a global scale. However, more needs to be done to strike a balance between building robust data sharing systems, as well as maintaining digital uh, privacy rights. 
Now, I know I've posed quite a number of questions as opposed to giving answers. And that's because I don't think I have, I, I don't have the answers to everything. Mine was more to, you know, throw that challenge to us as members of the open source community to start thinking about how we can prepare for the next pandemic because it's going to happen, right? Whether it's in our generation or our children's generation, you know, we need to start thinking about the things that we can do now that will then help others um, learn. Whatever I've shared before is definitely not a conclusive list. And, um, you know, I, again, I don't think that I have all the answers, but I do think that we have a huge opportunity as an open source community to start thinking about the ways to support preparedness efforts and start doing that now. Open source has always been heralded as, you know, being the giants on whose shoulders many people can stand on. I think now is a time for us to show the world how strong of a giant uh, we actually are. I wanna thank you all so much for your time and your patience. I'm hoping that this has been useful just to spark um, some ideas around how we can start to prepare, but then also just reminding you of what the power uh, open source has um, in responding to different crises. Um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have um, at, at this point. Thank you all so much. Thank you, engineer. <clears throat> that was really an interesting talk especially covering everything that we are seeing today with COVID. Thank you, thank you for that talk. Yeah, we have really good time for questions. I'm gonna wait here. Um, so attendees, if you have any questions, Angela is ready to take. <clears throat> They can also be comments if you have any comments. Um, just you know, let, we can do this open as a an engaging discussion for sure. I see one comment coming from Justin, saying talking about some issues that you you were talking about that SpaceX is already addressing. Uh, okay, there's a question in the chat. So, so how did privacy and other regulations affect your work? Right. So I think the. Just given when, when you look at the origins of, of, of Ushahidi and some of the areas where it's been, um, you know, it's, it's largely been used around human rights protection, crisis response, and there's a huge recognition of the fact that we are working with very vulnerable communities. So privacy has always been central and key to the work that we're doing. Um, we have, you know, a, a duty of care to protect the identity of our sources and make sure that we're not putting them in harmful situations or exposing them to uh, retribution by different parties. So I, I, I don't think that it, it's really had um, that much of an impact because those were all mechanisms that we'd set in place before, you know, making sure that we are GDPR compliant, um, making sure that we can allow for anonymous reporting um, and, you know, doing a lot of education through our support services and through our community, a lot of education to people who are deploying the tool to think about the kinds of data that they, they are collecting, why they need it and how best to make sure that they are uh, adhering to ethical standards when, 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 when working with the data. Sure, thank you for that. While we are waiting for other questions, let me ask you if, are you currently in Kenya, you said? Yes, I am currently in Nairobi, uh, in Nairobi, in Kenya. It's about 7.48 p.m. <laughs> Where wow. <am> I am. okay. <laughs> yeah. How are everyone doing around you with COVID? Um, I mean, we're doing as best as we can. I think we're probably being hit by a second wave currently. Um, so we're expecting a new set of restrictions to hit us uh, very soon. Um, I can see another question coming in from our good friend, Michael Downey. Um, do you, so becoming a tech platform that could be used across many governments and civil society organizations seems challenging. Besides privacy, as mentioned, do you see other challenges that communities should focus on to be as widely useful as, as possible? That's a very, very interesting, uh, very interesting question. Um, I think one of the other things, especially now, um, is and I think I probably touched on this a little bit towards towards the end of my presentation. Um, when you look at the 
the lockdowns and you know restrictions on movements and what's what that's done to people in terms of their social and economic status that has had a ripple effect in, um, in terms of what tools uh, people have access to or what or what they can afford and so while you know the world has been moving and thinking about okay fine schools are closed can we move towards e-learning and you know homeschooling and all of that the reality is that there's many communities out there who cannot they they might have access to a smartphone or those tools but they can't afford the internet right or it might be a case of there being five children in one household with with only one mobile phone and so one thing that we've as a Shahidi and even myself personally have been trying to think about and really advocate more of is making sure that we have a good understanding of our audiences and the challenges that they may be facing and optimizing and adapting towards that right so right now when we're looking at the fact that people aren't able to move around as often so a lot of development uh, organizations are not able to go there physically what are some of the other ways that we can we can engage with some of these groups right you know um people aren't able to access physical books are there you know open platforms where that allow for people to access some of these uh, some of these libraries and things like that are we thinking about building for offline access um are we thinking about accessibility in terms of language so those would be some of some of the other ones to to think about so accessibility um yeah accessibility and just thinking about some of the the exacerbating inequalities that COVID-19 is exposing right now. All right, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> this comment from Michael again, food points and food for thought, indeed, is a center design continues to be critical for open source. <clears throat> It's around seven in the evening there. Well, going to eight p.m., but it's fine. I'm used to this. <laughs> okay. When you work in a global system that has people across different parts of the world, you have the time zone dances. It it is an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We are in Raleigh, and this is around noon in North Carolina. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. We are on the east coast. Okay. Let's see. Um, so there's a comment by Ceylon about time zone ending up being more of a buyer than languages, it feels like. Honestly, yes. Um, I mean, especially if, you know, especially with right now with the realities of people being able to participate virtually. I know it's, it's been a challenge even for us at Ushahidi. How do you balance out the times when people are available and when they're not? You know, is somebody going to be able to wake up at midnight to jump on a call or participate in a webinar and, and, and things like that? Um, but language still seems to be a really, really big one. One of the challenges that we should probably throw to ourselves right now, even while, you know, while having this, are we optimizing for people who are not English speakers? Right, you know, so I, I definitely do take that, that that point, but language is still a really huge barrier. I agree. I have a beautiful background and I, I keep looking at that. I miss that. <laughs> Are you muted? Yeah. yeah, I was saying I, I, I just made sure that everything in my periphery was outside so that all you're seeing is the wall behind me. Yeah. And the... <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Silona. I definitely agree with you. All right. Any other questions, comments from anyone? I mean, maybe it's even um, thinking about, uh, you know, are, are there any other challenges that I didn't mention on the talk today? Um, or could we, you know, brainstorm and start thinking about some of the other things that we could be doing uh, to prepare as opposed to just, just responding? Thank you, Celine.
Ooh, that's a good one. As a nonprofit, have I noticed any new challenges with getting funded now that COVID has shifted priorities for donors? Um, I would say yes, yes and no. I mean, just like with the refugee crisis, the moment COVID-19 hit, there's a lot of donors who then shifted their attention towards um, COVID-19 response and funding some of those some of those activities. So even, uh, even now, I know that there's a few of them that are thinking about you know, cushioning some of the nonprofits around. Um, for us, I think it had the opposite effect, to be honest, um, just because we saw a surge in use of the platform, right? The, the, the need for the tool being available to people who are trying to respond to the crisis was so much, you know, was intense. And so the need for more resources to then come in and, and you know, support some of our work has been evident and it's been I, I wouldn't say that it's been you know too much but we we've been able to get some funding just because of everybody who's trying to focus on some of those activities and the fact that it seems like we're smack that we're smack in the middle of it but I, I also do comment that I've been seeing a lot of you know whether it's private foundations and philanthropic organizations um, as well as governments just trying to think of ways of cushioning um, businesses, nonprofits, tech organizations from, from, from the impact. So as much as you might not be working directly um, on response or preparedness, it's thinking about just, you know, it, it was the social protection programs that I was talking about before. So I think the expectation was that, you know, the, the, the funnels would be completely closed, but they haven't, they haven't. Let's hope that 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 get changed and then you get some good new funding. <laughs> Crossing fingers. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Uh, Angie, is, it, is that influx of funding and interest continuing and are funders staying engaged or do you see it as a one-time thing? Initially, I thought it was a one-time thing, but then, like I said before, I think COVID-19 has come in and we likely have far-reaching effects that will be felt for years to come. So at the very beginning, it was really focused on responding, but then now there's a bunch of other things that are coming up, whether it's some of the uh, concerns or issues around human rights protection, whether that's surveillance by governments or police brutality and all the, all the protests. Um, as I mentioned before as well, these uh, you know inequalities are really being exacerbated. Whether it's the poverty levels and things like that, so it might just be a, a case of the the nature shifting a little bit. But this is this is probably going to be a thing for a long time to come because there's a lot of progress that has been made that we've been set back and we need to figure out a way of, of catching up and that's directly connected to COVID-19. So I expect there to be more programs um, from people really just trying to invest in getting us back to, to a sense of normalcy and dealing with the effects of COVID-19, at least up until we get a vaccine. <laughs> so right now I, I can't see an end to it just yet. I can actually allow Celine to answer if she agrees with your answer or she has any comment. Yeah. Is Celine already speaking? I cannot hear her. No, I, ca I can't hear you either, Selim. Yeah. Let me also allow Michael. If Michael or Selim has any last comments to. Okay. And let's see if Selim. I 
Is this Salona, not Celine? <laughs> Were you asking me or Celine? <laughs> we, we also have one, one attendee called Celine Tekets, you know? Yeah, yeah. Celine was asking, that Celine and I are friends. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. But I'm Salona <laughs> and she's Celine. Yeah, I enabled you to, because I, I saw you also enthusiastic about this talk. Thank you. All right, if we, if we don't have any more questions, I, I would allow Angela to take off from here and enjoy yeah. the rest of the evening. All right. Well, thank you all so much for taking the time to join my session and for the interesting insights as well as the comments. Um, in case you have any questions just about our work or want to chat some more, my email address is angela at ushahidi.com. I'd be more than happy to, uh, to chat or just engage with anyone. So thank you again.